Thank you for joining us. Uh, we are uh, discussing repercussions of Taliban takeover of Afghanistan, what the US should do. And I'm joined by three experts uh, on the topic. And it would be good if uh, more throughout the United States would, um, would talk to people like this, uh, as opposed to, uh, unfortunately, what we've seen throughout the last 20 years, if not even before, uh, talking to people that really don't know the culture, the religion, the politics uh, on how to navigate uh, countries like Afghanistan. And uh, in addition to that, of course, Iraq uh, and many other parts where the United States has intervened. Um, we are joined by Farhad Popal, who serves as an advisor to the Women's Initiative at the George W. Bush Institute. She is currently the Immigrant Affairs Manager for the City of San Diego. She formerly led the Women's Initiative-led uh, program at the Bush Institute and is responsible for research and programmatic efforts that empower women worldwide to lead in their communities and countries. Also with us is Harris Terran. Uh, he is senior policy advisor at the Department of Homeland Security Office for Civil Rights and Civil Liberties. And Harris, as many of you know, uh, is uh, our former uh, director of our DC office and policy director uh, for the Muslim Public Affairs Council. And uh, finally, Dr. Maryam Kondrat, uh, who founded the Muslim Students Association at Cleveland High School. So she's been involved uh, from her very early years. After earning a doctorate in philosophy from the University of Southern California, Maryam became a lecturer and has more than 10 years of experience at California State University Long Beach. Additional teaching experiences include uh, five years with the Islamic Center Sunday School Program. And Maryam has produced youth-focused shows on an Islamic cable TV show produced by the Islamic Center. Uh, and she's written on the Muslim American identity. <clears throat> so uh, to start us off, um, I'd like each of you to just provide some opening comments uh, on the recent events of the, of the last week um, and uh, what uh, you see happening now as the deadline of August uh, 31st for the United States to pull out is fast uh, approaching all of us. So we'll start with uh, Farhat. There's there's a lot to say there. <laughs> I, I think that a lot of us are very worried about the impending deadline and the inability to evacuate the number of people that need to be evacuated mm -hmm. for safety purposes. Um, the United States owes protection to not only the women of Afghanistan who have risked their lives and worked with us over the last 20 years and longer um, to secure human rights, humanitarian assistance, um, education and economic opportunities to the men of Afghanistan who have worked alongside um, the international community and or, or haven't, you know, who, who have worked toward progress and are now at risk because of the Taliban's ideology and the, um, frankly, the, the, the lies that have been very prevalent on television and in English language, in, in their English language sort of conversations with, with media and saying, well, there's general amnesty and safety and we're not here to you know take anybody's property or, or to hurt anyone and privately we see the opposite um, absolutely people are at risk and the, the the inability to evacuate vulnerable Afghans whether that's Afghans who uh, who fall under the categories of SIVs or p1 p2 applicants or humanitarian parole or Afghans who have, who disagree with, with Taliban ideology and are now seen as opponents of, of the regime, everyone is, is at risk. And so being able to keep the airport operational and safe as long as possible, um, safe is a relative term, but being able to, to do that is incredibly important. And whether that is an August 31st deadline or not, I mean, that deadline is arbitrary. Um, so I, I would I would just say I'm I'm incredibly worried in, in this moment. Yeah, I think we all are, and and definitely uh, the images that we're seeing uh, from there, and you know people trying struggling to 
get out uh, is very worrisome. Uh, and uh, we're going to talk a little bit towards the end of the program of how people can help uh, in, um, in refugee assistance, in foster care, and uh, what we can do as, as Americans. Um, Harris, uh, I just want to go to you in terms of, you know, there, there was a supposedly clear goals of nation building, uh, building infrastructure, advancement for human rights, and it left uh, as soon as the United States announced its withdrawal. So where do you see the mistakes that were made uh, on those goals? Thank you, Salam. First of all, I wanted to thank, um, thank you and the Impact family for hosting a conversation on this topic, um, and especially by, for centering uh, Afghan voices. I think that's part of the challenges, as you said, for the past 20 years, and, and when you introduced this panel, um, it wasn't the voices of, of Afghans that were being listened to in the halls of Washington, in the halls of Congress, in the White House. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I speak in my personal capacity. I, I saw which voices were listened to. Um, and those voices, unfortunately, um, uh, are some of the same, same voices around the table right now. And they caused this mess, mess and they continue to, uh, to embroil us in this mess. Uh, the mess of the intervention of Afghanistan, the mess of the, the war and the nation building aspect of it, and then the mess of withdrawal. Um, I don't think there's any doubt. I think the narrative is trying to be built now that we didn't go into Afghanistan to nation build or to build a democracy or to save women from, from the Taliban. Um, I, I think that's a narrative that, that is trying to be built now to to uh, ensure that our our um, withdrawal is, uh, you know, is a, uh, there's an excuse for the withdrawal. But when we went into Afghanistan, we had multiple goals, and it was stated by then President, then Senator uh, Joe Biden, um, and President Bush, which was to, of course, uh, you know, topple the Taliban, uh, dismantle the Al Qaeda network, but at the same time, also help the Afghan people build a country that was representative of who they were. The Taliban were never representative of, the, of Afghan society, neither 1996 nor today. And so that was a clear goal that most policymakers in Washington DC were had a consensus on. I mean, if you asked any congressperson, any senator, anyone in the Bush administration, they would have told you, we're going in to help Afghans build a society. Um, and we did that, and there were some, there was gains, there was positive steps that were taken, but there was also mistakes. Many mistakes by us, many mistakes by the Afghans themselves, and many mistakes by the regional and international partners. And I think for us, one of the things that we didn't do was empower Afghans that really wanted to build a representative society um, that, that wanted to ensure that corruption did not um, did not really spread into the system and become endemic in the system, unfortunately, which it did. Um, uh, we didn't listen to voices that said, let's marginalize some of the warlords, the ethnic warlords, who would eventually cause problems for the government, the central government. Um, uh, let's not build a strong um, uh, central system in Afghanistan, let's build a system that is regional, provincial, federal, that would allow for a more representative government. None of those voices were listened to, including the voice that said, bring the Taliban into the peace, into the bond process in Germany to establish the next government in Afghanistan. Those voices were completely marginalized. Those voices were sidelined. And we essentially built a army and a government in our shadow. And um, unfortunately, in a region like Afghanistan, that doesn't work. Um, and I don't wanna get into all the details of how we built the army and how the government was set up, but voices um, who were saying this all along were not listened to. Um, but now, unfortunately, the victim of that is the people of Afghanistan. Again, the people of Afghanistan suffered 20 years prior to our intervention and the people of Afghanistan continue to suffer. Um, and, uh, and so I think what we have to do again in this process is uh, realize that it's the people who suffer. But I also wanna make one point that's relevant to why MPAC should be concerned about this. 
and why American Muslims should be concerned about this. As we get close to the 20th anniversary of 9-11, we have to remember what, what it was that caused the two decades of Islamophobia in America, um, at least the, the blatant Islamophobia. We had more, um, uh, you know, uh, Islam, we had Islamophobia, Islamophobia prior to 9-11, but the blatant political politicization of Islamophobia happened after 9-11. Why institutions like MPAC and others were, cre were created, why you had to invest more uh, infrastructure, why our children were bullied, why Muslim organizations were shut down, why American uh, Muslim civil rights and civil liberties were impacted. All of that was due to an event that were facilitated by the Taliban. They might not have planned the event, but they allowed that event to take place, which impacted the lives of American Muslims. And we suffered the repercussions of that. And I just, you know, I think it's, it's a sobering and it's a somber reflection that 20 years after 9-11, when we remember 9-11 again in a month or less than a month, the Taliban will be back in Afghanistan and ruling that country. So we, I think um, it, it's, it's really difficult, but we, it's a lot of processing that we have to do. Thank you, Harz, for that uh, good overview and you know, a lot to talk about um, as we proceed in this conversation. Uh, Miriam, uh, you know, I, I had run into you when you were actually on a plane going to Washington or going overseas to help uh, in dealing uh, with uh, uh, rights for women. Uh, and, and I know that that's a big topic right now in, in terms of uh, what, what will happen to, to women and, and to all this talk about, uh, about their rights. So tell us, uh, in your words, what, what you were working on, what your hopes were, um, and, and how you're going to channel your efforts now. Well, first of all, thank you so much, uh, Salam, and I really appreciate MPAC really prioritizing this topic uh, today and trying to figure out, um, and hopefully we'll hear from audience members, uh, some good solutions on how we can craft a way forward from uh, this avalanche. And that's really what it is, Salam. We were working, I was going to Afghanistan at least three, four times a year, uh, working, um, I mean, originally I was, uh, I was actually working with the Afghan embassy in Washington, DC, representing women's affairs, the Ministry of Women's Affairs, the Ministry of Higher Education, uh, went on to you know, help start up the American University of Afghanistan and on from there to help empower women through the um, e-learning process. The national, I wrote the national e-learning strategy, et cetera. And the reason why I bring these up is because of the fact that it now sounds almost like, like um, some, some, something of, of way, a, a, a completely distant past. Uh, the events that just happened, this, this, uh, I, it really is apocalyptic. Um, I, for example, have been scrambling now to try and see if we can evacuate those university partners. All of those women and all of those university champions and the best minds to be able to come out to safety. And the Taliban just announced that they will not allow any Afghans to leave Afghanistan and the entire road to the airport is closed to Afghans. I mean, every single hour, every single you know, day, there's a whole, a different shocking level of regression in the society. So what we were hoping for was to, was to kind of come back to the original Afghan identity before all of the deprivation and the wars, the civil wars had happened and go back to the interpretation of Islam that Afghans were known for. Uh, you know, Jalal al-Din Rumi, the, the sense of spirituality, the quality of the inner faith, the, um, the, the level of humanity that Afghans were known for and their contributions to uh, to civilization, to society. I mean, they have a very rich history. So um, to see that all of a sudden everything was just scrapped, policy has shifted, maybe the Taliban are good for business because they can deliver security better than the central government was able to. So they might be able to protect our investments better. If we were to, for instance, lay down a TAPI pipeline project, um, that's it. And um, 
and so I, I mean, it is, it is extremely, um, you know, people were, you know, especially in my sector, willing to die for education. I mean, when I would come from the US, people were dying to just, if I had brought any book or anything that they could possibly read, that's how much they were thirsty for knowledge, for education, for being able to connect with the rest of civilization. And you, the lights just went out. So um, obviously we'll continue the discussion and I'd like to hear from everyone else on a way forward. But um, I, I can tell you that my, the whole center, uh, my whole center has shifted. The whole center of gravity has shifted for Afghanistan. And um, it's, it is not, uh, this is not what the United States is supposed to be about. You know, uh, I, I just don't, uh, I just, I kept, I kept holding out hope saying, no, 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 I'm sure they've got a plan. This isn't, this isn't where we're going with it. Let me wait, let me wait a few days. This is all going to take shape correctly and properly. And, and it's, as you can see, it just keeps getting worse. You know, uh, it was over 20 years ago where I was invited to a, a, a meeting and this was before 9-11. And it was foreign policy people, um, I think State Department uh, people, and a representative of the Taliban. And at that time, the meeting was all about, hey, the Taliban is not as bad as you think they are. And, uh, and they mentioned the pipeline project uh, that the Taliban was going to help uh, the United States was, uh, with. But then 9-11 happened, I think, within six months after that. And then, you know, there was a reversal. It seems like we're going back to uh, the pre-9-11 uh, era in, in, in that sense. But I want to go back to Farhat, you know, in terms of U.S. policy. Uh, it, you know, I, I believe that, you know, I think we all agree it, it took a big hit. I mean, who can trust the United States when we, when we say, you know, we're going to be there for you. We'll, we'll back you up. I, I don't see anybody now trusting the United States government in that. So where does US policy go in, in, you know, in the region uh, when credibility is so low? It's a very important question. And to be honest with you, I haven't spent as much time thinking through that as, as we will need to moving forward because the situation over the last week and a half has been so dire in terms of the humanitarian crisis, in terms of trying to push the US government to do everything it can to support people getting out, to expedite visa processing, to ensure that we have humanitarian assistance that's able to actually get to the people, seeing the number of internally displaced populations that have traveled from the provinces to Kabul and now have, have nothing. Um, and don't have the, have that support. So, you know, my my honest answer is at at some point I'll sit down and think about longer term uh, implications of U.S. foreign policy. But right now, the the focus really needs to be on pushing the U.S. government to do everything it can in this moment, where there is still a small window of opportunity to potentially negotiate with the Taliban to allow humanitarian corridors and supply chains to, to stay open, to expedite processing for, for Afghans who are, are leaving, um, to work with third party countries to make sure that, you know, these flights that, that have left um, and may no longer be, be able to leave, that they have somewhere to go while these people get processed and supporting um, their re resettlement here in the United States. We have Afghan refugees who are arriving ev every day and they're being processed and eventually they're going to be resettled all over the United States. And so making sure that at the local level, local governments, refugee resettlement partners, local communities have everything they need to be able to support these populations and laying that groundwork and that foundation because the, the need the need in, in that sense is, is going to be long-term. These refugees have, have seen incredibly difficult journeys. They've experienced trauma. They you know, are probably separated from fa family members that they're worried about. Um, they're going to need a lot of support and that support needs to start now. 
and that foundation needs to be built now. So for, for me personally, I, I have been focusing on that piece of it. And eventually we can, we can reckon with all of the impacts of this, this situation um, on U.S. foreign policy, on our allies, on our adversaries, on U.S. global engagement in the world. Um, I'm personally very interested to see what this democracy summit is going to look like, because how can we talk about democracy uh, how can we talk about women's rights? How can we talk about women's inclusion and peace processes? How can we talk about um, dignity and, and respect and support for um, refugees and migrants globally if every time we have that conversation, the caveat is Afghanistan? Afghanistan can't be a footnote. It can't be a, a caveat. We can't keep putting an asterisk next to next to an entire country's name and 38 million people when we talk about these things because it dehumanizes an entire population. It does. And you know, I was I was struck by President Biden's remarks about the situation in Afghanistan when he said that the center of his foreign policy is human rights. Uh, and yet um, you know the 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 two allies of the United States in the Middle East, uh, one is a monarchy and the other one is a military government. Uh, so we have a long ways to go in terms of bringing human rights into foreign policy in a, in a real meaningful way, meaningful way that really uh, secures civilian populations. I think we're still talking about securing geopolitical interests uh, and not talking about uh, the people themselves. Um, Harris, when we talk about refugees, then how do you frame? I mean, it's a to us, it's a moral responsibility. It's you know, we 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 really put these people in danger to to commit to the United States efforts. Now, now we're 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 uh, turning our back uh, on them. So we feel it's a moral responsibility. But in Washington, that's not how it works. How do you frame the conversation in terms of bringing these refugees? Uh, to safety, either here in the United States or other other countries outside of Afghanistan. Uh, no, that's that's an extremely important point, Salam. I've um, it's a bit personal uh, for me. Not only am I, I was a refugee as a child, I've spent the last three days uh, at a refugee processing center here in Washington D.C. before I leave to go to Doha at a to work at a refugee processing center. I've seen. Um, in the past three days, I've heard the most unimaginable stories from people who, um, you know, mothers who whose toddlers were not they were not able to take on the plane with them, uh, children who uh, who were just thrown onto the plane and whose parents and siblings were not able to get on the plane. Um, I had to accompany a twelve-year-old child who whose parents just pushed him on the plane because they didn't see a future for him there and who um, who was literally had never left the company of his parents. And this was the first time. And now he's an accompanied an, an unaccompanied minor in the US. The, the, the stories are heartbreaking. So the humanitarian side and the moral side, as you said, is very real. And I think there's a lot of people who are thinking about it in those terms right now because of the images that they see in at the airport in Kabul, the images that they see on TV. Um, but, but beyond that, these are the people who fought with us. They stood with us. They believed in the American, what America sold to them. They believed what we sold to them. We sold to them the idea of a democratic society, even if it was not perfect, even if it was fledgling. It was only a 20 year experience. experience. We have over a 200 year experience and we still are fledgling in, in our democracy. Uh, it was a 20 year experience and it was fledgling. We sold them the idea of women's rights. We sold them the idea of education. We sold them the idea of fighting terror. 70,000 Afghan national security and police forces lost their lives in the past 20 years. They stood next to us. They were not only translators, they were combat uh, allies. 
they were the ones on the front lines fighting Al Qaeda and Taliban and and Daesh and the Islamic State of Tajikistan and the Islamic State of Uzbekistan and these groups who are a threat not only to us but the region. These people are people who stood with us, they believed in us, they actually believe that we will stand with them and that we will be there for them. And I think many of them, as I was talking to them just last night, I left, I left the processing center at 2 a.m. last night. And the last family that we sent off from the processing center to one of the bases uh, to get processed, um, a gentleman, it was an elderly gentleman, just kind of broke my heart because he said, I go, he said, uh, he literally told me, we believed you guys. He said, we believed you guys. And, um, and now uh, I said, you'll be, you'll be comfortable. He said, I know I'll be comfortable, but my homeland will not be comfortable. And, uh, and so that's one aspect of it. So it's not only a moral aspect. Yes, there is the moral aspect, but we know that in politics and in Washington and in the next midterm cycle and 2024, uh, there's going to be fear mongering. There's going to be Islamophobia. There's going to be security threats. There's going to be, why are these people in my neighborhood? They don't speak English. They don't look like us. They, they, uh, so we, we've seen this repeated over and over again. Um, not only with, with refugees and folks from that part of the world, that region, but also from the southern border as well. But I think what we have to, the way we frame this is that these people were our allies. They deserve every level of respect, honor, dignity that we can provide them. Because they stood in America's moment of need, if you want to call it that, and now we have to stand with them in their moment of need. And I and um, it, it's you know the tragedy of all of this is that uh, how, uh, however many of these people that we get out hundred thousand hundred and fifty thousand whatever it may be two hundred thousand there are another thirty eight million people really the majority of them who also um, bought into this uh, narrative that we will stand with them so I think there's the moral conversation around refugees that's not going to that's not going to win the political battle. What we have to do, and I think our advocacy and our engagement has to be that we, these are the people who stood with us, they engaged us, they believed in us, and now we have to honor them and stand with them in their moment of need as well. And I think, you know, what, what's, what's important is a lot of the veterans groups right now are coming out. Many of the veteran groups, people who served in Afghanistan, people who served multiple tours are, 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 are preparing um, you know, advocacy um, uh, uh, days on the Hill. They have really taken on the cause of, of their uh, comrades and their families who stood with them and who fought with them and who engaged with them. And so I think what we have to do as, as, as uh, Afghan Americans and Muslim Americans, we have to reach out to veterans groups. We have to reach out to uh, immigration uh, groups who are not uh, usually uh, from that part of the world, but maybe from more of the southern border and South America and Latino groups. We have to read. We have to really build allies in so many different places to ensure that all of these people, as they integrate into society, that they receive the support, the help, and the acceptance that they deserve. Very well said. Thank you, Harris. I think also we as American Muslims should call the bluff of groups like the Taliban or anybody that tries to use Islam as a form, uh, as a source of legitimacy. You want to call yourself an Islamic state or an Islamic emirate or an Islamic republic uh, or an Islamic kingdom. You cannot use the word Islamic unless people feel secure under your authority. That is the prophet's model. That is what the Quran says. And if you can't meet that standard, if you can't pass that litmus test, I think we as American Muslims should just call their bluff and say, you are anything but Islamic. Uh, and, 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 and maybe that will help stem some of the Islamophobia uh, in this country, because let's face it, that's what people are seeing, is, is these Islamic groups doing the most horrific things, brutal, barbaric and um, you know just we're all disgusted by it and and uh, maybe the tide will turn in the future inshallah but I think our time to speak uh, is now uh, if, if that's all we can do that's what we should do um, 
and and Dr. Mariam, uh, I, I want you to, and and also I want to go back to Farhad and Harris, if you all, if you all could help on this matter. And then we're gonna we have a number of questions already from the audience. We got to get to them uh, before our time is up. Um, how can people help in terms of supporting refugees, in terms of foster care, children, orphans? Um, what What's available out there if somebody wants to help, if somebody wants to be a foster parent for some of these refugees? Well, that's a good question um, because that's an immediate crisis need. And I'll go ahead and post a link and I'll ask others. I'm sure a lot of the Afghans also on the, the attendees have different, I, I've seen so many different groups who are stepping up to the plate on the foster care. So um, I will I will paste a, a couple of links in the chat box and I hope that others will also share uh, the information and the resources they have. Um, you know, in, in terms of, in terms of uh, you know, your, your point, Salam, that you signaled that, you know, that really there isn't, there isn't a sense of a moral obligation really to help, right? And that really this, this comes down to these, um, these policies which are tied to other interests. Um, I just have to say that the images of seeing the Afghans ravaged the way that they are and the way that, you know, all of the images that I don't need to repeat, um, it really creates a lot of sympathizers for the um, uh, terrorist narrative that, look, this is exactly, this is exactly what it's all about. You know, we warned you, and this is what they do, et cetera. Uh, you know, the Taliban openly are saying to Afghans at the airport, they're lying to you. The Americans keep lying, saying, we'll take you to the airport or we'll take care of you. Oh, why don't you work for us? Be on our side. And then look at you now. That, you know, so uh, not only do they, not only do they, you know, the, by this behavior, the United States creates, you know, this, 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 these sympathizers with the terrorists abroad, but also within the United States. There, are, um, it really does activate these sort of transcendent interests that people are willing to die for, and so I think that that's something that we need to be cognizant of as something that's very, very real. Um, and in terms of, you know, in terms of some of the things that we should be speaking for, calling for, as you mentioned, time to speak now. Um, you know, I'd like to say that, you know, on the on an immediate basis, the United States needs to use its diplomatic efforts, right, to work with some, to, to provide clarity with India and Pakistan on cooperation uh, there uh, on the borders to have free flowing uh, humanitarian aid, uh, to be able to allow people safe passage and so forth, um, that the, that we should, you know, there's there's been a great deal of money that was appropriated recently for example, to the Afghan National Army, uh, you know, calling on a reappropriation of all of that for refugee settlement. Um, and um, and I have a number of others, you know, uh, points to make, you know, in terms of you know immediately asking for a meeting of the, uh, you know, the UN Security Council, um, to and so on and so forth in terms of these diplomatic efforts, so that we can really make them understand that this is not just us saying, hey, you can't do that. You guys should just really you know, be good to the whole world and just continue to pump money and effort into Afghanistan and just leave the soldiers there forever. Um, this is a you know, very, very, the, the breadth and depth of this issue is, is, and, the, and the ramifications of, of this policy shift um, can be uh, far reaching when it comes to obviously United States security. We already saw it before. Um, you know, I just read the, the meeting minutes of the Taliban's latest meeting. And I can't tell you how professional that the, their, their meeting minutes were and the, how, how focused their agenda was on banking, liquidity, on economy. This is not the, I mean, obviously they do have those ragtag elements, but this is a, this is a much more sophisticated Taliban than 20 years ago. Um, so I hope that we don't underestimate them by thinking that they're just some, you know, wild barbarians running around that could never reach us or get to us in any way. Thank you. Um, Harris, uh, Farhad, any groups that we need to keep to focus on in terms of support uh, for Afghan uh, refugee assistance? 
any way people can get involved if they want to be foster parents or uh, help out with uh, settling some of these refugees. And I can post um, actually in less than uh, a half an hour. There's a webinar that we've put together together at the Afghan American Foundation for fostering foster parents for potential foster parents. I will put that in the chat box so that people can go there. It's literally within a half an hour. Uh, we have gotten we've put out a call uh, to parents because we know they're unaccompanied minors. Uh, we know that more will probably be coming. Um, and uh, we have heard some um, we have some heard some troubling reports of orphanages in Afghanistan uh, being emptied out um, and young people and children being put on planes and flown out uh, on chartered flights. Um, and so we are doing some work around that. So I, I'll, I, you know, after I finish my remarks, I'll go ahead and post that link onto the chat. Um, but I think the point right now is currently uh, in uh, there, there's multiple stages. There's the immediate stage that people are, are arriving. Uh, they are being uh, mostly um, uh, vetted for within the 21st, first 24 hours. Then they will, the majority who were not um, uh, US citizens or green card holders will actually go to a base, a US military base. There are three or four identified that people will go to. They will spend about two to four weeks there being processed, immigration work being processed. Um, they will be given their, um, uh, a set of um, uh, potential aid and, and services that will be well, provided and allotted to them. Uh, they, can, they will then be released to certain cities to resettlement agencies. And there are multiple resettlement agencies across the country, uh, groups like the Lutheran uh, Church Services, Catholic Charities, uh, so many different one across, so many different ones at a national level. Um, and I think what, what we can do is um, pay attention to institutions that will help these individuals integrate once they get to the resettlement part. Right now, they'll be okay on the basis. They're going to have food, shelter, clothing. They will be taken care of there. What we need to do is fund those institutions that will, there will be government funding, but we still need to ensure that we're funding institutions that are resettling these organizations, uh, these individuals. And we'll, I'll put a couple of links in there to uh, organizations that we can support. And I don't know, Farhat, if you want to add, uh, add some more. I, I will just say, um, I also spent some time today compiling lists of, of both um, the National Refugee Resettlement Organizations and any of them that have specific links for how to support Afghans in the US, I've, I've compiled those too. So I will copy and paste that in, into the chat for, for anyone who, who is interested. Um, I would also just recommend looking up the local refugee resettlement organization in your city or county because it differs um, based on where you are. So there's an opportunity to support those organizations locally. Um, and there are also nationwide organizations that, that, that are supporting. I will also re reiterate and, and just emphasize um, Harish John's point that the, the integration work is going to be both short term, medium term, and long term. And that support is going to continue to, to be needed. Mm -hmm. And so I think on a narrative and messaging side, um, Create, helping to create and foster that welcoming and inclusive environment for refugees generally, but also for, for Afghans specifically, that's going to be really important because whether it's with, within, you know, Muslim American um, communities and, and organizations or more broadly in your, in your locality, uh, a, a lot of people may not have met an Afghan before. Um, they may not know much about what experiences they've had, what trauma they've experienced, um, and being able to, to be welcoming and foster compassion and respect and dignity um, and empathy for what these people have experienced. And anybody can do that in their day-to-day -day life, in every individual interaction that we have, whether that's with our colleagues, our friends, the stranger on the street, that individual interaction helps to create a welcoming environment and, a, and an inclusive environment. So I, I would just say oh, this, this extends beyond, you know, where can we donate? Where can we volunteer? It also extends to our, to our personal inter interactions, our community interactions, and creating the, the 
the warmest environment that we can, both for refugees coming in, but also for, for all of us, right? We all wanna, want, want to live in that type of environment. Thank you, I see that you have, um, uh, if you can, if you can go ahead, uh, uh, Farhat and Harris. Yeah, okay. So you have uh, listed some of the organizations there on the chat box. Thank you very much. All right, let's get to the questions. Uh, Omar Amir Abid asks: Recent CVS YouGov poll shows uh, 80, 81 percent saying U.S. should help Afghans who helped us uh, to come to the U.S. Poll had only two percent error. So it shows Americans want vulnerable Afghans to come. The poll also said we are not doing enough to help Afghans. Can we use this poll to get Biden to extend the August 31st deadline? So public opinion is in support of bringing Afghan refugees. Um, can we use that as leverage to lobby the White House? Anyone want to take that? Well, I think part of the challenge today, the Taliban announced that they will not, uh, that they do not expect to allow the U.S. or international forces to stay longer than the 31st. So it is no longer just the president's decision and Biden's decision. Um, it seems as though the Taliban have, uh, have, have uh, put a marker down. They had not put a marker down yet. Uh, they had been they had been ambiguous in terms of how they would deal with this issue. Today, they made two statements that I think were troubling, and that I think we need to be very forceful of and pushing back against. Number one, they said that they didn't want you international forces beyond the thirty first, and the second statement that they made was they would not allow Afghan professionals, physicians, engineers, government workers to leave, even if they don't feel safe or they feel threatened those two statements should be pushed back against by the international community. And I think part of the problem, which goes back to our first point about normalizing the Taliban and rationalizing the Taliban has been, they have not lived up to their end of any commitment or bargain that we've made with them. We have been the only ones that have committed and actually lived up to that bargain. So when we said we'd withdraw, we've withdrawn. We said we're going to uh, you know, we told them don't attack major cities, they attacked, we didn't do anything. And so this red line that we set keeps getting pushed back further, further and further, and they will not respect us, neither will anyone in the region at this point. So I think we need to tell the Taliban at this point that they cannot set the terms for our withdrawal anymore. We are withdrawing, that is a reality, but we will do it in a way that is good for us, but it's also good for those Afghans who are vulnerable, those Afghans. I am working on, there, there's, there's an organization who had 1400 Afghan women around the country in Afghanistan, on the ground in Afghanistan, who had been doing domestic violence work for the past 20 years, human rights work, local peace building work. With these 1400 women all feel vulnerable. They had centers, domestic violence shelters that they had set up in, in rural provinces. The Taliban have come to them and said, you are brothels. You are now brothels. You have been doing illegal activity. Those are the type of people we cannot leave behind in Afghanistan. It's not only a moral issue. It is also an issue of ensuring that we live up to our commitment and that people in that region see that we will stand by our word. Thank you. Uh, Holly Hazard asks, she says, I'm getting significant pushback on Facebook on speaking out in protest about the imminent loss of rights for Afghan women. Quote, you are a white privileged feminist and aren't listening to what Afghan women want, end quote. I assume many Afghan women want equality and opportunity. Why is there such hostility here? And how can a white privileged feminist best help? Who wants well, to take that? I would love to take that one. First of all, I'd like to say thank you so much for joining us today and for sticking up for Afghan women. That is, uh, that is just such a treasure and such a gift. And um, I'm gonna go ahead and actually put my, my personal email address in the chat box. I would love to connect with you afterwards. And there's a whole host of things that I think that you can be getting involved in. Ali is a really good friend, Mariam John, so I'll connect you. Oh, now. okay, perfect. Well, she's already plugged in there. That's great. So I, I just wanted to say that, um, 
it, it reminds me of when uh, when the Taliban came into power, Mavis Leno actually held like a fundraising event to help the Afghan women. And a bunch of Afghan ladies got together and went over there and protested in front of Mavis Leno's program and said, you know, basically stay out of our business. And we, you know, we have our own culture. And just because, you know, we, we wear a headscarf doesn't mean. And these women were absolutely clueless uh, about what was going on uh, over there on the ground. And if you would ask them, when, when was the last time you were in Afghanistan, you know, and, and what are you basing this on? It was just based on the sense of, you know, a very misguided, uh, ignorant perspective. So I highly encourage you to stay involved. Um, as far as um, as far as the, the true reality is concerned, uh, I'll give you an example just in terms of the education sector. So they just appointed um, a minister of, edu of a higher education, the Taliban did. And, um, you know, we'd been working with Harvard and MIT uh, through edX to create these, these online courses that were gonna be, you know, teaching the kinds of subjects that were gonna meet the job market demand in Afghanistan. And uh, they basically have thrown everything out and said, you need to be teaching um, Islamic law and religion and so on and so forth. And so you have to realize, by the way, they're on their best behavior right now. This, this month is like their best possible behavior that you're going to be seeing. So, um, so I just wanna caution folks who wanna make a case for you know, relative, cultural relativism and uh, you know, because the cultural relativism really runs short when it comes to infringing upon basic human rights. And that's the kind of crisis that we're seeing today. This isn't a matter of, you know, uh, you know, you have your way and I have my way. You know, people, people's lives and futures are in jeopardy. Thank you. Uh, Narma Ali asks, I watch Afghan TV stations that interview people on the ground. The Afghan people complain about lack of food, lack of work, etc., but they also say the situation is more peaceful. Do you have some information as to what is really taking place in Afghanistan? Because some say these interviews are propaganda. Maybe Farhat has some on the ground, some local perspectives you could share with us. So I, I think this is a very difficult time for verifiable information. And the reason is, if I were giving an interview to someone on television right now, and I knew that three feet away, there was a member of the Taliban with a gun looking at me as I'm doing this interview, I'm probably also going to say that it's safer than it was. Um, and I think that that's something we should take into consideration. Also, these interviews are all being done in Kabul. They're not being done in the provinces. And the lack of, of credible, verifiable information is, is an issue. And it, and it will continue to, to be an issue. Um, we're already hearing um, of, of gross violations of human rights, of the Taliban going door to door with their lists of who worked for the US government, who worked for the Afghan government, who worked for the international community, who just simply opposes their ideology. And there's no information coming out because everyone is afraid for their lives. So who is going to take the risk of reporting this information um, more broadly than just to their immediate family members as they're whispering in, into the phone while they're in hiding, right? And I think that's something we should take into consideration when we hear anything that seems to normalize what's happening right now, because at this moment, people are facing life and death circumstances. And the information that we see on television um, is probably not the full picture and doesn't take that context into account. And I just wanna briefly mention that I'm in contact with university chancellors and professors, faculty members, the brightest minds throughout the entire country university in, in Khost and in Herat and Kabul and Kandahar, and all of the various provinces, the regional universities, Mazar Sharif, and all of them are in sheer horror. Folks have not even left their house. They're on complete lockdown. Uh, so, uh, you know, there's, there's uh, no sense of, you know, this 
idea that, oh, everything's actually, you know, all, all good outside and we're fine and everything. And there, everybody is scrambling and there's, there's pure terror. The Taliban already have a track record there. It's not like this is the first time. The first time around, they came and said that they were sent by the former king and that everybody should lay down arms. And as soon as they laid down arms to the Taliban, they said we would put the king on trial for his crimes. And they inflicted terror and they did bring security to Afghanistan. So uh, that security obviously came with a price that was, that was incredibly high for the Afghan people. But I just wanna let you know that I am in, in contact with locals uh, you know, every hour and, uh, and they're in deep trouble, Our, all of our allies. Uh, another question from an anonymous attendee. What is the role of the US to apply pressure on Pakistan to use its influence on the Taliban to prevent further suffering in Afghanistan? Farhad? I, yeah, or, go ahead, Farhad. Okay. And I also want to make a point about the Pakistani embassy uh, making money right now on hiring Taliban guards to escort you to the airport. But please go ahead. I think I think there's a lot there. And honestly, I might defer to Hodish John on, on this question um, because he's been doing this work longer than, than I have. But the general thing I, I would say is there is absolutely opportunity to pressure Pakistan, but the United States has so far over the last 20 years refused to apply any of it. And I'm not sure if moving forward, there will be appetite to do so. I hope so, certainly, um, but we haven't seen anything in the last 20 years and that is concerning to me. Well, I mean, on the issue of Pakistan, it's a twofold question, right? It's a, first of all, I think Afghans themselves need to learn how to live with Pakistan as a, as a neighbor. Um, and I think that in of itself is an issue that unfortunately has not been fully resolved. Um, and I think, um, which has caused pain for, for, uh, for Afghanistan and for, for the region. So I think that's the first part. I think the second part is, uh, historically, uh, you know, initially when we went into Afghanistan, we had um, um, we relied on Pakistan heavily, and so it, we didn't put pressure on them to close the Taliban safe havens, the camps, the training camps that the Taliban, um, uh, you know, were engaging in on the border. Um, it's a very difficult region, and uh, Pakistan did not put pressure on the Taliban to close those camps to stop recruiting people from some of the madrasas. But that's because we relied on Pakistan to do uh, a lot in Afghanistan. Uh, we, our supply chain, our uh, went through Pakistan, uh, our uh, refueling routes went through Pakistan, our, uh, because it would have been so much more expensive to go through air uh, through other countries. So um, it was a difficult, it, it wasn't a black and white issue. It was a difficult issue. It continues to remain a difficult issues, issue. And I think what we need to, um, what we need to do is figure out how these two countries can come to terms with each other. Um, that hasn't happened as of yet. Um, and whether it's pressure from the US, whether it's um, civil society, people to people building, the two countries have not come to terms with each other as of yet. Thank you. Um, yeah, I, as far as, I think we only have a few minutes because you have to go to this webinar uh, in, in a few minutes. Uh, so uh, as far as all the links here, our staff uh, will, will go ahead and copy them and paste them on uh, our Facebook page so that uh, all of our attendees can uh, make use of them. Uh, I just have a few questions. Uh, for the few minutes we have. So if we can also just be very brief in the answers and try to get to as many as possible. Freezing of Af by Syed Sami, freezing, freezing of Afghan assets by the US and IMF basically chokes them up from creating a functioning governing system. Should this not be vehemently opposed by all who want to see a functioning governance system? I think, uh, you know, another question is, you know, the sanctions that have been placed on countries like uh, Iraq in the past only hurt the people, did not hurt uh, the dictatorship. Is that the same in Afghanistan? Uh, 
Um, I'll just jump in uh, really quickly. In, in terms of the uh, uh, the economy, the um, the economy was standing on international aid, right? So uh, so that international aid literally just evaporated. Um, so on top of that, you have uh, those assets being frozen and so forth. So I mean, we all don't we don't have to be you know economists to understand what will happen to the to the uh, you know, the state of affairs there, what will happen in terms of supply and demand, the supply chain, how far your money will go, et cetera. It is going to be, uh, you know, again, I, I use the word apocalyptic. Um, so this, uh, this situation then you, it presupposes that there should be some aid, humanitarian aid that would come in to directly access the people. And those aid agencies, including groups like Amnesty International, et cetera, who are at least going to be able to keep an eye out for what's going on, are all packing up and leaving, if not have already left. Um, and so I would say, absolutely, this is very damaging to, to the regular Afghan person who is trying to survive. Thank you. From the perspective of a grad, uh, Ula Mikbel said, asks, from the perspective of a grad student, how can we future scholars encourage our university and boards to speak out for the Afghan situation, especially from a pedagogical uh, perspective. Uh, how do we advocate for those opposed to or ignoring the potential loss of knowledge sharing from the region? I'd like to defer to the other panelists and then I can follow on or I can write in the chat. And then also if you wanna make your closing comments. We're going to have to wrap up now. I'll quickly make my closing comments and connect. Oh, sorry, Farhad, did you want to? No, no, please. You first. Um, I think the, the, I, the, the thing that I would say and to be part of my closing comments is just to humanize uh, uh, Afghanistan and Af Afghans. I think um, the past 20 years, uh, uh, you know, in the beginning, right after 9-11, there was some level of humanization of you know, uh, uh, of Afghan women, but it was really in the form of like, uh, it was a victim narrative, right? It wasn't It wasn't in the form of an empowerment narrative. And Farhad John can talk about this because she's done so much work and research on this in this area. Uh, but I, I would say um, that as the Taliban take over um, and they will probably become a boogeyman government for a while, uh, we will see things coming out of uh, Afghanistan um, Taliban wise when it comes to implementation of Sharia law and and restrictions on on gender uh, on women and on men on so many different things um, I think they we, Afghanistan can again once again become an orientalist bo boogeyman but I think what we need to do is make sure that we're humanizing uh, Afghans uh, there's 38 million people who have wives who have families who have dreams who have aspirations like like Americans and like everyone else and they really, they really believed in the um, in our promise of democracy, and um, and education, and um, and Afghanistan had a had an amazing civil society in the past twenty years, one of the most robust civil societies actually in the whole region, and it was it Afghanistan rated number one on the Press Freedom Index in that region, uh, so it has a it had an amazing civil society, it had a robust. Um, uh, uh, you know, media, private sector media uh, that had that had developed, um, and I think those are all being lost. Um, we just saw Tolo, Tolo TV, which is the most prominent. Uh, everybody will know. Every uh, Afghan knows Tolo TV. It's the most prominent private media channel in Afghanistan. They stopped playing music before the news. Uh, 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 before they they call the news now. Um, they stopped playing music videos. So you're seeing, as one friend on the ground told me, um, we may even have security, but they will take our souls. And this, I think I'll end with that, is that we just need to humanize and continue to um, uh, remember and engage and figure out ways to support the actual people. Thank you. Farhad? What, what I would add to that is don't let Afghanistan be forgotten in the public narrative, whether that's continuing to pressure our members of Congress and the administration, whether it's um, continuing to 
make sure we advocate for Afghans and actual support on the ground for the, the civilian population, that support is going to continue to be needed. And unfortunately, the, the media cycle is, is impatient and, um, and moves on very quickly. So my request would be, please don't let that happen. Thank you. And Mariam, you have the last word. Thank you. Thank you so much for putting this on, Salem. I actually want to turn it to you to tell us what uh, what the action item is supposed to be. Uh, out of this, there's a lot that we can be doing in terms of lobbying and pushing Congress. Uh, you know, con uh, co contact with uh, you know, Tony Blinken's office, uh, Secretary Austin, and so forth. So, um, you know, how you'd like to channel this group in terms of a, an actionable uh, set of items? I think. Uh, It'd be great for us to to hear. As far as as far as uh, you know, my closing comments are concerned. Uh, you know, we have um, you know we have an obligation as Muslim uh, as Muslims to to stand up uh, when when situations like this happen, and this, this is a serious test of our faith. Uh, it's a historic moment, and uh, you know we certainly are going to be judged in so many different ways uh, for what we do. Uh, you know, in response to this. And so we all have different talents and different means and resources. And I hope that uh, those are challenged for as long as we need to. And, and that we, as Farhad says, have the same power until uh, the matter is, is uh, improved in Afghanistan. Well, you know, and as we see the, uh, so many people suffering throughout the world, uh, we, we are amazed by their resilience. Uh, amidst the oppression and suffering. And so uh, Afghanistan and the Afghan people, uh, we uh, are inspired uh, by their resilience. And uh, I, I believe that this forum, like so many other forums, has connected us in spirit with uh, the Afghan people. Uh, and uh, whatever we can do to help, whether it's through the refugee assistance, speaking for their rights, uh, advocating for uh, their uh, their um, uh, their rights. Uh, that's what we will do, and I thank uh, all three of you for giving us the you know your expertise, your wonderful uh, perspectives that has enriched our understanding of the situation in Afghanistan and what the U.S. should do. So with that, thank you very much. Salam alaikum, and uh, hope to see you again in the near future, inshallah. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Salam alaikum. Alaikum salam.